Hi folks, and welcome to the Meaningful Money Podcast, Season 14, Episode 8. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew, and I'm going to share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Okay, folks, great to have you with me. We're on the home straight now. This is episode eight of season 14. And, you know, we're, we're in the run-in to the end now, the glide path towards a landing strip, if you like. Now, last week, we began to deal with the massive subject of our behavior around money. And today, I've got something pretty special for you, or rather someone pretty special. So after that, uh, obviously, as usual, I'll uh, read a recent review, talk about what we're going to be discussing next time. But before any of it, remember, this podcast continues to be brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management. They've been helping me out here since the spring of 2011 and could not have built this show to what it is, this whole project really, to what it is without their help. So I'm really grateful to them. Please do check out what they're up to. They're at 7im.co.uk. That's the number 7 im. .co.uk. Also, check out the new Meaningful Money branded self-investment platform that those guys have built for me. Um, MeaningfulMoney.tv slash podcast invest is the place to go to find out more about that. Okay, my friend Neil Beach will introduce himself very shortly. Um, it's fair to say, though, that he knows his proverbial onions when it comes to the subject of behavioral finance, all right? And I hope you enjoy my conversation with him. Remember, notes and links, including a full transcript. I don't normally do that for interview shows, but uh, we've done that this time. My thanks to Gudrun, who's done the hard work of that. Um, there, all that stuff, all that good stuff is at the show notes. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash N A eight for new accumulators episode eight meaningfulmoney.tv slash na8 it's also a great place to leave questions for neil after you've listened to the interview which is coming right now well it's my pleasure to welcome good friend and a gentleman i hugely respect uh, in my world neil beige founder of biq welcome mate how you doing i'm very well what a lovely introduction pete thank you for that well, really nice I've been watching BIQ for ages, and uh, as you know, because I keep nagging you, um, you know, wanting to um, find out more about what you've been building, and you, you've built it carefully because I think this is going to be a game-changing thing. But long-time listeners of the show will know I'm fascinated by behavioral finance, the way we behave around money, and its massive impact, of course, on our wealth building. And so that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Yep. In the past, we've had Greg Davis, you know, a mutual friend of ours yep, um, and uh, a genius, no question. But I want to get a slightly different approach on it. But before we dive in, Neil, give me a bit of background, please. What's your, uh, what's your story, mate? So I have had a lifelong interest in psychology, I guess, and that started when I left school. And I wanted to, at the time, to be a PE teacher. So I studied to be a PE teacher. And as part of that course, I had to do two things, which have have had a, a lifelong grip on me. One is human biology or physiology, how the body works. But the other one was sports psychology and, and how, how the brain works, especially in relation to things like um, a golfer who is trying to make a one-foot putt hmm. and is could make them every day of the week. Yet yeah, because it's for the masters, you know, or, or what it misses. And, mm. and, and I've always been interested in what's going on up here when those things occur. And that kind of lifelong passion has, has stuck with me. And as I developed my life and as I developed my career, that kind of moved into the realms of just general decision making, especially re in relation to money and what's going on up here when people are making important financial decisions. So not necessarily the, the conscious stuff that we're aware of, actually the unconscious stuff that sits in the back of our heads that we have no idea exists really yet when we make important decisions immediately comes to the fore and has a significant impact in the outcome so i've always i've always had a fascination with this i worked in financial services for a FTSE 100 company where i was head of strategy and then i left there and set up a one-man consultancy firm working for other companies and then i just was looking at the way they were interacting with customers and there was a common theme, Pete, the, and the, the, the common theme was that there is, a, there is was, is a mm -hmm. tendency for those companies to 
target customers based on kind of quite arbitrary things like wealth or you know demographic profile. And the thing that they tend not to look at are the things that really matter, like financial capability, their that you know knowledge and understanding, that in their their ability to make important decisions in the first place that have an impact on their life. So I I, I saw this happening and thought, you know what, Neil, put your money where your mouth is, mate. Do something about it. So I set up BIQ, and BIQ is a behavioral insights company that achieves what I set out to achieve, which is getting under the bonnet, if you like, of the behaviors and the the, the decision-making processes of the average person, that the man on the street, because that's who I think needs the most help. Yeah, well, I absolutely agree, man. That's why I set up this whole thing nine years ago. It's course, ordinary people that need to know this. Not, you know, I don't really give a monkeys about advisors or um, really I don't care too much about very rich people because they can afford all the help. It's, it's those on the ground, day-to-day, Earning right. a living, saving for the future that I that I care about and who this sort of project is for. Absolutely agree. Um, it's fair to say, mm. I, well, I'm going to ask you, do you agree that behavior is arguably an even bigger factor in people's success with their wealth than actually how they're invested? Is it right to say it's bigger or it's certainly big, isn't it? I think it's the, well, I would go as far as saying maybe I would because of the job that I do. I would go as far as saying I think it's the number one um reason for success or failure actually because you know you could you could go to a financial planner and you could or you, you could pay serious big bucks to access some of the best investment managers in the world who could build you seemingly the best investment portfolio available known to man so everything um is set up for success but the one factor that sits underneath all of this is you mm. It's you and your behaviors. It's you and how you perceive the world. It's you and how you take in information, how your brain computes that information, and how it forces you into some form of action or or, or inaction. Um, So I think unless you understand your behaviors and your behavioral tendencies and how likely they are to to impact your financial um, decisions, then actually you are ignoring a fundamental, key, critical part of the entire process, mm. in my opinion. Oh, yeah, I absolutely agree. And this is it's sort of rising to the fore now and has been over uh, for a while, but I think will increasingly uh, become more prevalent. More people will be talking about it because there's plenty of people who will give you, you know, Ray Dalio's all-weather portfolio. It'll cope with anything. It's like, well, it might, but will you? You know, or the, the plenty of people telling you how to invest but not how to behave. And it's just such a big deal that, you know, we'll do my bit in, uh, in my little corner of the internet and you'll do your bit. But hopefully between us, uh, we'll, we'll get the message out. No, that's right. Now, let's talk about biases. Now, this is a massive subject, Neil, right? When there's no way we're going to uh, sort of <laughs> plumb the depths of it in 30 minutes or whatever, 40 minutes. No, but, absolutely not. But let's talk about biases because I think these are things yes. that people can understand. These are, Am I right in saying that these are kind of the natural sort of standpoints that we bring to bear on our decision making are we all right to just go through a few of them but is that is that absolutely a decent, i'd love to is that a decent I, sort of uh, description of what they are it is and, and the way that i describe this in you know when i talk to people i say i, I kind of do a, a layman's version of what you just said so i say this when we make decisions we because as humans we're not wired we're not built to think hard and long hmm. and every one of your listeners will know this right when you um when you concentrate on something that is cognitively difficult, you physically feel tired. Mm-hmm. You know, the brain takes a great amount of energy from the whole body in doing what it does anyway. So we try just evolutionary, we, we, we try to um, not think hard. Mm-hmm. And in order to not think hard, we, we um, take shortcuts. So we kind of, we, we, uh, we make decisions based on the rule of thumb. And that's what psychologists call a heuristic. Okay. Now, these rules of thumb get us through life, but they, absolutely they do, and they and they're good things to, to have. But when a heuristic kind of fails to give us a satisfactory outcome initially, what happens is we apply filters that we've gathered through life and that we continue to gather through life. And these filters are, in essence, our cognitive biases. Okay. You know, they they, they and, and they can cloud our judgment very easily. And the thing is, with biases, of course, is they don't arrive in decision making one at a time. But they're not like a, a, a line of buses lining up and one comes and you deal with it and then it vanishes. They arrive at the same time and they can have a 
significant impact on the output. And there are many of them. Um, but I think going through a few of them is a really cool idea. Well, I, hopefully it'll just give uh, people some food for thought and then you know oh. we can sort of look deeper into it uh, in the future. So let's, uh, one that often comes up whenever I hear people talking about this is something called anchoring. So let's start yes. there. Okay, so anchoring. Anchoring is where you place um, too much emphasis or you place too much importance on the first piece of information that you see. Okay. Um, so there's many experiments, some fun, some very serious, that look at anchoring. Um, so a, a fun one is um, a guy walking around a town centre. This is on YouTube, this video. Mm-hmm. A guy walking around a town centre with a bag of um, ping pong balls that are all numbered 1 to 100, or so people believe. Mm-hmm. What actually happens is every ball has the number 70 on it. Okay. And he asks people to pick a random ball, and they do, and then he says, okay, I have this bottle of champagne would you pay 70 pounds for the champagne? And people say, no, I wouldn't. But okay, that's fine. How much would you pay? And they're 65, 60. Mm -hmm. And they use the 70 number as their anchor for the negotiation. It is the same the day after. This time the balls are all numbered 20. Right. And and of course now, would you pay 20? No. How much would you pay? 15, (laughs) 16, 17. So the, the, the 20 number becomes the anchor. And we do this subconsciously. And this was, there's a great deal of research um, that was done. But if you go back to the kind of the founders in in modern terms, if you like, of behavioral finance, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, they looked at this from a very scientific way. And they presented people with um, a question. And they said, what is the answer to this maths question? And they presented two groups with different options. Option one, one times two times three times four times five, and they went all the way up to the number eight. Right. And they just said to people, just guess what the answer is. And the average response, I think it was the median response, was 512. Right. That's what people thought the answer was to that question. The other group, he said, what about, what's the answer to this? Eight times seven times six times five times four, okay. opposite direction. And the median response to that was 2,250. <laughs> Okay, so it's right. the same sum, just framed same, either way, right? Okay, framed and anchored in right, a different anchored, way. Yeah. So if you anchor it in a ascending way, the response is different to if it, if they're anchored in a descending way. Yeah, the right. answer, by the way, and I'm just looking at my notes on the screen, is forty thousand three hundred and twenty. <laughs> so both nowhere near. <laughs> both of them are nowhere near. Yet the answers are quite significantly different. Yeah, so sure. and 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 how information is presented to us initially allows us to or, or we use that information to base every other decision off it's why when you go to a car salesman you know the, 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 there's a big price on the car and mm-hmm. it's not necessarily the value of the car but they are anchoring you to a figure that they hope you will they will use for negotiation mm-hmm. same as house prices when you're buying a house that yes that yes this house is worth three hundred thousand pounds but you know what it's it's anchoring you to a value and we haven't got the ability to do the the cost benefit analysis to really figure out the value of the house. So how does so, that work with investing then? So how does anchoring come to bear when people are looking at their investments? So what if I said to you, Pete, here's an investment. Um, you know, the majority of the time this returns six percent. Mm-hmm. You know, are you happy with that? Now, just by mentioning a figure to you allows you've now you will be anchored to that six percent figure Mm. and if you say oh well not really okay p so what you know what would you be looking for i'm pretty i'm pretty certain that your response would be around about that six percent figure Mm. if i'd have said four percent it would have been around that four percent figure so in 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 the world of finance how information is presented to customers can have a significant impact on um, how they perceive and process that information and, and can, in some cases, and it's why scams work, Pete, mm, to be honest, sure. you know, you know, they say, oh, look at this investment, you know, um, 8% over the next two years, blah, blah, blah. And people look at it and they are anchored to that information. It's also framed different, and I'll, we'll come out of framing maybe, um, but, but it's, a really, it's a really powerful bias mm. anchoring um, and has an, has, has an impact in every walk of our life, including finance. Well, let's take that as a notice then. Let's talk about framing. So related but different. Framing is one of my favorite because this is scammers paradise, right? Okay. Framing something in a way that people go, "Oh, I want one of them," you know. The, and um, so again, we use a really uh, a light-hearted example of framing. When I speak at conferences, I put up on the screen the image of two yogurts, and one yogurt says eighty percent fat-free, and the other one says contains twenty percent fat. 
<laughs> and, I, and I say to the audience, if you were to choose a yogurt, I know you can see that they're the same thing, but if you were just to choose a yogurt in the instance that you saw them, which one would you choose? And of course, most people, when they're being honest, say 80% fat free, because seeing something that says contains 20% fat mm. is framed in a quite a negative way. The other one is framed in a more positive way. And we are more inclined to, to steer ourselves towards the kind of the more positive messages. Um, but I'll give you a real life example. This is this is a little bit of unique insight because I haven't shared this with anybody yet. So you're the your listeners are the first people to hear this. We're honoured. Listen up, folks. Oh, you are very honoured. <laughs> we have just carried out some behavioural research. We do this frequently anyway. But what we looked at a set a handful of specific biases, and one of them was framing, because I'm really interested in framing. I understand its power, and we presented people with so there was three groups of people. There was what we call the control group, and the control group get a statement, and it's the full statement. Then we, then there's another group which only see a positive message, and then an, another group which only see the negative message. Okay, mm -hmm. does that make does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. The question was this, or the statement they saw was this: an investment return was five percent compared to the expected return of four percent. Okay. The month before, however it returned 6%, right? That full statement. Mm -hmm. When that was presented to people in the control group, 87% of them thought that was good. So the answer is, is this good or bad? 87% mm -hmm. of them thought, oh no, that's good. Mm -hmm. In the group that only saw the good statement, which was an investment return was 5% compared to the expected 4%, that's all they saw. Mm -hmm. The amount of people who thought that was good increased to 92 percent <laughs> or the eight okay. percent thinking anyway <laughs> that's humans okay that is absolutely but the third yeah. group become is where it gets interesting the people who only saw the negative so they only saw the statement that said an investment return was five percent the month before it was six percent the amount of people who thought that statement was good was 32 percent mm -hmm. okay. yet so how we present information and what we choose to omit and what we choose to add in mm. can have a significant impact on how people process that information and how they see that whether that information is beneficial or whether it's going to be detrimental to them. Um, framing is, is a, again, another powerful bias. And when you put framing and anchoring together, of course, yeah. like I mentioned about the buses don't arrive at the same time, okay. if something is framed in a really positive way and people are anchored to a big number because of the way it's being framed, I, you can make people make stupid decisions, which is where scammers mm. and, and people who spend their life, sadly, ripping people off, um, they know this stuff mm. and they exploit that that bias weakness that we all have. Setting aside, obviously, fraudsters and scammers and, and stuff, is it possible for you know the financial services world to ever frame something neutrally? I mean, obviously, we live in a capitalist society, so they're going to want to put a positive bias on it, but... Mm. Is it possible even to be neutral? I can't imagine there's any way of putting anything which would still be readable. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure the word is, I'm not sure the word, it, it is, we can be neutral, but I actually don't think that's the word. I think we can be honest and transparent. <laughs> yeah, much better word, yeah. That's, that's the word. If we were honest and transparent with people, I think that allows them to make a more informed decision instead of giving people half the story and assuming that they are bright enough, and, and, and I'm not mm. saying people aren't bright, or, or have the, the, the cognitive ability to figure out that there is another side to the story mm. here. You know, f when people see 8% return over over the next 12 months, if you give us a 10,000 pounds or whatever, you know, people should just pause and go, really? Mm. I need to look into this. I need to read the small print. Because when they read the small print, they see oh, this, this isn't what it's all cracked up to be. Yeah, I, need to, I need to see a clear of this. You know, mm. you, well, we all know that phrase. There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Mm. We, every, every one of your listeners will have heard that phrase. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible phrase, really. But, it's, but unfortunately, it, it rings true. true. Yeah, so it's true. Okay, so anchoring and framing. Yeah, it's mm. really important to, you know, folks, if you're listening or watching to this, to, to start to think, okay, how, how has this applied for me? How have I made a decision based on something that I've, you know, have been anchored to or whatever. So it's important that we're just trying to sort of self-assess as we're going through this. Let's no, that's about, right. Let's talk about present bias, Neil, if that's okay, because this is another one which uh, mm. has a big impact on people's day-to-day -day financial decision-making. And it has a big a big impact on their financial plans, mm. actually. Okay. So 
let me let me ask you a question and answer this honestly. Yeah. Um, you you are the voice of your listener here. That's true. Um, would you rather have twenty pounds right now or forty pounds in a week? See, I'm so, I'm so bad at waiting. I think in, <laughs> with the, with those numbers, I would say I'd have forty quid in a week. Okay. Now, what what you've done is you are uh, you are delaying the immediate gratification. Yes. Twenty pounds right never, now. I never do that. For, for, for a, <laughs> most, most people don't. Um, for a kind of bigger mm-hmm. future based reward, right? Now, what happens in reality when we play this this kind of game with people is we say, you know, twenty pounds now or twenty two pounds, and it's a small it's a small increase. And people go, no, I'd have the twenty pounds now. And what we do is we try and tempt people with bigger and bigger amounts, okay. and everybody breaks at a different point. And the benefit of doing this is it is it is it shows whether people are willing to wait for the bigger future reward, or whether that kind of pull of now is really important. Present bias is probably the the biggest influence in the battle between our present self and our future self. Okay, you know, our future self is saying. Eat the salad, you idiot. Eat the salad. And my future self is going, but I can smell the burger. Yeah. And it's got bacon and cheese. I mean, come on. Why would I not want to eat that right now? And your future self and present self are always in a battle. Mm, um, truth. When it comes to money, that doesn't that's just equally as true, right? Mm. You know, should I should I buy the new um, iPhone X? I don't need it, but look how cool it is. Mm. Or should I put that money towards my pension and my retirement? Mm. You know, this this battle is is ever waged is ever waging and and um and that's what and, and present bias is the is one of the key elements of of that battle oh yeah i mean it's yeah paying yourself first it's um the now versus the one day it, it, it's the crux of the financial planning battle and and those who generally win mm-hmm. are those who are able to set their sights on the future um it, it you know it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Oh, hmm. But you right. know, if you're going to build wealth, it can't all be in the now, can it? it no, that, sort of... that's right. And I think and I th- and I envy you know advisors like you, Pete, who because I I could imagine it's a struggle at times, um, knowing these behavioural biases are playing out all the time. So so you you, you design a you know a bloody good plan for your clients mm-hmm. and. And and they agree to it, but actually life takes over and their behaviors take over and then they potentially could derail that plan and then you have to remaster the plan. And yeah, sure. I, I can imagine that being a, a struggle at times. It is, and it, but it's a core reason, I think, for an ongoing relationship with a good advisor. It's almost an accountability right. thing. So right. it's a coaching, keeping you on track, saying, well, look, you told me that you wanted to achieve X by such and such a date. Mm-hmm. Um but actually, over the last year, your behaviors haven't been in line in that. You know, do we need to rethink that? What yep. were the reasons for those behaviors? I mean, I have a nutrition coach, a uh, mm-hmm. called Tracy, who has done a masterful job of getting inside my head and working out why. When I say I want to look a certain way, mm-hmm. I then go and eat what I eat. And, you know, she, I pay her to hold me on track, and it's slow mm-hmm. but sure progress. And that is essentially what we are doing for our clients. But it's a massive thing to get over. Um, no, it is. It when, is. When you're uh, faced with sort of statements like, well, you only you only live once, it's not a rehearsal, those things are all true, but it's a, it can be a fine line, right? That's right. You know what? I heard a statement, um, it must have been about two weeks back now, and I love this statement. If somebody was, it was that you just said the phrase, and somebody counted it, you only live once. Mm-hmm. And some guy said, actually, that's not true. You only die once. <laughs> you live. You live every day. Mm. You know, and if you don't live your life every day to its fullest, then you're doing yourself a disservice. And it was one of those statements. I thought, you know, I, I, he's flipped that completely on its head. I yeah. like, I, it, and it's absolutely very true. But but going back to to, to present bias, um, you know, in in the financial planning context, present bias, of course, is one of those things. But there's a whole raft of other emotional or affective biases. That are, that, that are playing out so it might not necessarily be present bias it could be something like loss aversion mm. you know so you're sitting at home you have a financial plan but you see the markets are falling all that's you know the last three days the markets are falling every day mm. you know loss aversion kicks in and and a, a whole other raft of biases kick in at the same time and make you feel a particular way and make you act potentially in in, in a detrimental way to your financial plan so present bias is one of them but there are mm. other biases as well 
Yeah, I want to come back to that. I just want to deal with um, something called confirmation bias, which is another, <laughs> another one that I come across all the time with clients, and I'm sure you do as well. Um, yep. Before I bring it out, can you just explain what confirmation bias is and how that works yeah. against people potentially? So confirmation bias um, amongst um, a lot of academics is kind of known as the mother of all biases. Is that right? Um, <laughs> and mainly, mainly because every human even when you are conscious of it, are not immune from it. It is such a powerful bias. And confirmation bias is where you have uh, an opinion or a view and you seek out information or evidence that only supports that view whilst at exactly the same time ignoring any evidence that could prove you wrong. Right. <laughs> um, so let me give you an example. Um, I'm making this up on the spot. Say, for example, you decide that um, a particular country that you want to go to is unsafe. You've, you've made that decision. You've heard things on the news, and, it, and there seems to be trouble there all the time, even though you've heard from other people it's idyllic and beautiful. Um, so you decide to do your research. What you would tend to more often than not do is go onto Google and type in things like crime statistics in, mm. you know, um, how many crimes are there are in this particular country? Is this a safe place to go to? You know, you would you, you would frame the way that you ask the question in order for it to give you a response to an already held belief. Right. You believe it's unsafe and you're trying to find evidence that proves that what you should do is you should kind of go onto a Lonely Planet website, yeah. for example, and just type in information about mm. a particular country and look at both sides of the story, of course. You know, and and confirmation bias is um is really powerful we we when we seek this evidence and we find it we say see told you so mm -hmm. I, right. I knew i was right <laughs> and and i spoke to john and john said exactly the same as me therefore mm. he's also confirmed and you said, yeah but did you speak to mary because mary says the opposite oh she doesn't know what she's talking about <laughs> these are the these are the these are very real mm. discussions and debates that every human has and and i hate to do this on a podcast of such quality, but, but I'm going to mention Brexit. Oh, mate, how could you? Yeah, carry I on. I know, because Brexit is confirmation bias on steroids. <laughs> you on. know, if you think about the amount of people who searched for confirm confirmation mm. on their their kind of badly held views about certain things, like immigration, mm. for example, you know which was one of the key things in Brexit. Yet if you look at the evidence and you look at the facts, it doesn't bear out what mm. the message was. Yet people can, of course, they can find, oh, I've seen the number of immigrants from, from Europe, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but have you looked at all the other countries? Doesn't matter. No. You know, I believe this and the evidence is showing, the evidence isn't showing you that. Mm. Part of the evidence is. And, and if you look at all the debates around, or the majority of the debates around political subjects like Brexit, you can see confirmation bias screams at you in the mm, face. I'm as, sure. as, as does framing and anchoring, of course. Yeah. Think of the bus. Yeah, exactly. Framed in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Big number. So we're anchored to the big number. Mm. And every time I search for information, I can find it because there's so much fake news out there. Fake news is confirmation bias on steroids mm. as well. Um, you know, so all of these biases come together to 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 take a nation down a path that potentially maybe they shouldn't have gone down yeah exactly so we got i mean we've, we've talked about just four and as you said there are plenty more besides i mean this has kept psychologists and behavioral finance experts busy for forever is it right. i mean are we sort of in talking about it just engaging in a sort of uh, philosophical anthropological sort of uh, discussion or is there any sort of practical way of applying this is there really any hope of us getting over this to the point where we can improve uh, our own response and our behavior yeah i think there is and and it's something that we have, have been working on for five years now um and, and as you know because we, we've had this conversation soon to be launching a solution to this exact problem so i'm a big i'm a big believer in um kind of putting behavioral science into practical i've got or giving it a practical application mm. because i can talk for a month of Sundays about this stuff. You know, you could sit with your clients and say, oh, these are these these biases exist and we all have them. And, you know, we need to be aware of confirmation bias and we need to be aware of anchoring. But what we don't know is to what degree your clients are affected by each of these biases. Mm -hmm. 
So, for example, you may have a client who is just, you know, the way that their brain is wired, the way that they've been educated, just their DNA is such that they always seek information that disproves their beliefs first. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so they have a much round, more rounded, formed opinion. Another one of your clients may be, no, I know I'm right and I'm ignoring all of this and I'm only looking over here. Um, but of course, you don't know which which of those clients is is which. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind um, de delivering um, a service that allows that to be exposed has been my five years work. Mm -hmm. Every every minute of my life for the last five years has been working to deliver something that can deliver that. Mm -hmm. So we can put people through a game of present bias, a game of confirmation bias, a game of anchoring and framing, and we can find out their exact. Um, the strength of their bias in each of those because only when you're armed with the information about the person and you understand how biased or not they are in a particular cognitive bias can you then have a meaningful insightful conversation about a plan for tackling them things you know so it's not just about behavioral coaching which i'm a huge fan of which is what this is all about i'm a i'm a bigger fan of coaching people in those biases where they they have a strong tendency mm. to potentially do something um that could derail their financial plan yeah sure the other behaviors where their biases are actually playing in their favor exploit them mm. and you know and, and focus the, the positive energy over there as well so i think there is an opportunity to for people to self-learn to become self-aware mm -hmm. and especially working hand in hand with advisors to deliver a much more behaviorally led financial plan yeah that's amazing i'm really glad you you because i feel like actually i've talked quite a lot about potentially negative mm. behaviors but there are positive ones as well these these same also, biases can be brought to bear in a positive way and it, it's knowing right. that isn't it no, no it absolutely is and and you know i i talk about this thing called um behavioral anomalies you know i, I talk about this a lot but mm -hmm. and, and what what i mean by a behavioral anomaly is where you have a uh, an opinion it's typically a subjective opinion so let's if i may mm. let's um let's slightly go controversial for to a degree let's think of the way that the industry assesses attitude to risk now nah, i was going to be my next question good Go oh ahead. okay okay good um we ask people a series of typically subjective questions yes what would you do if your investment fell by 10 percent um, what, would your friends describe you as a risk taker? Oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> the reason why, uh, and also the first one, what would you do if your investment fell by 10%? The answer to that question is I have no idea what I'd do. No, until, until the time it. arrives. Yeah, exactly. I have no idea. Stop asking me to predict. Um, so that's subjective in nature. Mm. Yes, they are. Yes, the good ones are psychometric. So they've been designed in a proper way. Mm. Brilliant. But generally the questions are, are, are subjective. So we're asking someone for an opinion, mm. you know, and of course, when you ask someone for an opinion, ego mm. comes into play, you know, their, their view of themselves. And I could talk about the, the bias of overconfidence, actually, which is really a powerful bias. I, I might come back to that. But we ask them a subjective set of questions to establish their attitude to risk. Yeah. When you then explore their revealed behavior, by playing games with them, doing putting them through different tests. But these tests now are more objective. They're more fact-based. Mm -hmm. We are actually asking them to make a choice, not what they might do. We're saying make a choice. When you, when you look at that, what you find in most people is that there is a what we call an anomaly right. between what they think of themselves and how they behave. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, that span can be quite what can be quite wide. Actually, you know, I think I'm really, really high risk. But when you explore their risk-taking behaviors, you realize that they are actually, they're more erring on the side of caution. Mm. Um, and and what, of, what, of course, happens is when markets move up, down, left, right, um, it's the behavior side that is the most dominant, not what they think, mm. but actually how they behave and how they react and how their emotions play out in that moment that makes them make a choice that can have an impact on their financial plan. Now, if you put together a whole, you know, a whole list of cognitive biases, you can actually see within them these behavioral anomalies, right. where some behind some behaviors are, are saying that they would do or they are going to do one thing, so the other behaviors make them do another. And I think understanding these anomalies in behavior allows, especially people like you, Peter, you know, and advisors, 
to say, okay, that's where I need to focus my attention. Because actually this is where we the the, the, the picture's a little bit gray and fuzzy. Mm. On, on these biases, crystal clear. I understand that they're biased or they're, or they're not biased. I get that. But when when these anomalies play out, um, it, it can be quite dangerous because even clients don't understand that these anomalies exist. And they can't mm. they can't go through a behavior or an action and then in hindsight go, oh, that was my anomaly that did that. <laughs> no. they, they, they can't do that. We haven't got the ability to, 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 to mentally model this type of stuff, okay. which is, you know, again, why we spent a great deal of time kind of drawing out these anomalies and presenting them in a way that people can go, okay, now I know and I've learned about myself. Yeah. Um, at least I'm aware and I can hopefully do something about this. This, I mean, the industry just hasn't had the tools, I would argue, up to now. Like you say, attitude to risk question, it's like a fraction of the conversation that actually needs to happen. Mm. And so often uh, the industry has kind of defaulted into, oh, well, you're cautious, hence you need to have this kind of portfolio, or you are moderately adventurous, hence you need to have that. Never forget somebody who said that they... Uh, they went into a bank years ago when the banks were still giving advice and you know they, they came out as cautious and so their entire liquid wealth went into a corporate bond portfolio it's just not as simple as cautious equals bonds and risk you know, moderately ventures equals equities or whatever it's just nuts and so that that sort of oversimplification i think the industry is culpable for that what would you say though let's say you know we um find out where these anomalies uh, stand. It was somebody's attitude to risk says one thing, and yet their particular behavior says something markedly different. Mm -hmm. What if, given that their behavioral uh, score is likely to have a greater, a greater uh, impact on what they actually do, what if that is at odds with what they need for their planning? You know, what if actually these people are going to freak out if there's a major market event and possibly sell at exactly the worst time, and yet they need to have a pretty meaty allocation to equity. Say, so what happens then? Yep. What do people do? What do advisors do? I think, I, I love this question because I think this is one of the, the I'm going to be brave here. I, might upset, some, I might upset some people. Nah. I, think this is a, I think this is one of the failings of the industry. Oh, I'm used to upsetting the industry. You carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm their best mate. Um, <laughs> no. In that, we seem to want to avoid having the difficult conversations with customers. So yeah. when somebody sits down in front of an advisor, in my opinion, and they say, this is what I want out of my financial plan. And you say, okay, that's fine. Your risk, you know, your, the, the amount of money you can save and that you have to realize this plan is not really sufficient at this point in time um and by the in the time frame that you've placed on this plan it's also not sufficient and your risk profile of, of five out of ten isn't sufficient but if i tweak the system and i put you up to risk level seven now there's a chance of you reaching your goal and i think that conversation is is deplorable Right. I, I, you know, I think changing a person's attitude to risk number just to reach a goal is actually getting out of the difficult conversation. The difficult conversation is one: you either need to put more money in, yeah, that's the other level, or, right? two, or two: you need to change the time. Mm -hmm. You can't retire when you're sixty. You need to retire when you're sixty-eight, or whatever that conversation is, because th those things can move. Mm -hmm. You know, but the, the one, the one component part, the, the level of risk that they are exposed to, I think should be established and never really um, faffed about with, really. Mm, now, going back to your question, we provide two outputs. We provide one which is an attitude to risk, a classic quest psychometric um, that questionnaire that your listeners would be used to. But we also provide several behavioral inputs into the, into the equation. And what, we, what that gives us is it gives us a range at the top end, where you see yourself, and at the bottom end, typically, by the way, top and bottom end, and at the bottom end, where you are um, comfortable, behaviorally comfortable. And actually, it's this, this, this part is more likely to be the, the catalyst for you doing anything yeah, sure. neg negative, right? And what we say is, you know, if you're in that range, then you're, you should be all right, actually, because at the top end is who you think you are, at the bottom end is how you behave, and, and sitting in that range, the more towards the top end you get, of course, Market movements create angst and mm. and and worry, um, but the more towards the bottom end you are, the the more impact it will have on the, the the length in which your financial plan has to run. Mm. Um, so I think 
that insight allows you to have that conversation with a client and to say to them, look, this is this is your risk range, if you like. You know, at, at, at the top end, it might be more uncomfortable. There may be more of a chance of hitting the goal. At the bottom end, it'll be more comfortable, but there's less chance. Where do you, where do you want to sit? Mm. But what we do as, a, as an industry today is we put them through an attitude to risk questionnaire and we say, you're a seven out of 10, job done. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't think I don't, I don't think I just don't think that's right. I don't think it's given the full picture. I think it's giving you a corner piece of a jigsaw puzzle, nowhere near the full picture. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And it's you're right to mention it, it is a sort of an, an abdication, really. If we just say, oh well, okay, we have got this little lever over here, which is the asset allocation or the risk of your portfolio. That's an abstract concept to most people, uh, and it is an easier conversation for an advisor to have than rather say, well, actually you're going to need to spend a little bit less and save more if you want to hit that target. That's going to hurt mm-hmm. now. That's right. And let's have that conversation because yeah, it's not a comfortable conversation. But it's I not. Think, it's not. But it's, I think it's a valid conversation and a needed conversation to have. Well, there's no point seeking advice and then just getting yes, you know, getting sort of um, confirmation of <laughs> confirmation again of what you already <laughs> think, right. is it? There's no point in paying somebody to advise you and then just hoping they tell you what you want to hear. Um, Absolutely right. You know, if I was doing that to my nutrition coach, she'd be saying, yeah, McDonald's, awesome, at least twice a week, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. what I would like to hear, but <laughs> clearly it isn't. So she tells me I'm an idiot when I eat badly. <laughs> so, yeah. no, and, right. you know, we need to hear these things sometimes, don't we? It's harder It's harder to, to speak them to ourselves than it is sometimes, I think, to hear them from somebody who we're paying. And no, this, that's is the, right. this is a challenge for people who... I, I've always preached on here that you can go through advice, uh, go through most of your financial life, certainly in the accumulation stage, without needing an advisor. There's some basic mm. things you need to do, but I've always said that everybody can benefit from mm. that advisory uh, relationship. And I think this is a key way where people can do it, holding yeah. them to account, keeping them on track, keeping them in their, in their seats when markets are messy and, mm-hmm. and keeping them from doing something which is going to derail them. No, that's right. Uh, can you uh, in uh the process of i'm going to talk about brq in a minute mm. which i know is um uh i'm super excited about um you've worked with some pretty sharp people in the in this process people yeah. whose uh, brains operate on a plane some way <laughs> above my own i wonder what you sort of any sort of key messages that you've learned from them and and you know in that whole process it must have been fascinating it's it, it, it continues to be fascinating. So we continue to work with some stupidly bright people. <laughs> um, and so, so since the day we started BIQ, we've worked with professors and um, leading academics in behavioral sciences. And, and, and actually, to start with, mainly just psychology. So we worked with a team of professors of psychology who, who allowed us to understand on a much deeper far more academic and scientific level mm. how the brain works in relation to decision making okay. um, and then subsequently we've worked we, and we continue to work with um, behavioral science professors some leading people in the world of behavioral science sit on our advisory board um, so one of them is one of them is one of your previous guests dr daniel crosby mm-hmm. yeah. um, he, he helps us out on our advisory board we're led by a guy called dr ariel shecky who's a, a an ex UCL um, researcher, doctor of behavioral research. So, so we, we work with some far more intelligent people than me, um, <laughs> me. Which, which is, which is always, which is always my mission of BIQ. Absolutely. Surround yourself by bright people. You can go and sit on the beach. Um, <laughs> but does you learn, you learn some quite staggering things when you delve into the research and the literature around behavioral science. And one of the key things I've learned is that, two things i'll talk about one human behavior will always surprise you Mm. even when you've read a piece of literature that says this bias is this and it means this therefore when you start to explore it it always will reveal something that makes you go wow i I didn't know that that's absolutely Mm. incredible and when you start testing people because people are people it reveals sometimes quite shocking um behavioral traits Mm. and and i and that every one of the academics i've ever worked with I've always said, be prepared to be surprised. Yeah, I bet. You, will, you, you know, in, and one of them, um, one of the early professors who's been doing this for 40, 50 years, he said to me, even now, I still get surprised by when I, when I research human behavior, there are still elements that surprise and shock me. Mm. And I've been doing it for 40 years. <laughs> um, and that just, that's testament, I think, to the fact that humans are humans and will, yeah. uh, uh, you know, and, and 
understanding what's going on up here is, is we're a barely scratching the surface i remember you saying that i heard you speak at andy hart's conference uh, like right. last november you told the story about about the lad who uh, draws the landscapes you just it that's just, right stephen wiltshire stephen wiltshire is an artistic savant yeah. It's, it's just an amazing example of the fact that we are not even scratching the surface of what the human brain can do. You just tell that story quickly, just for interest. Yeah, so um, Stephen Wiltshire is an autistic savant, and he um, didn't get on very well as a kid. He was, he was autistic, um, and lots of tests showed that he was clearly on the very uh, properly autistic, full-on autistic. But he also had an ability to, to draw um, and as a kid, he would he, he would look out the window and he would see um, things like a car parked outside, and he would turn around and he would draw the car in incredible detail from memory, mm-hmm. little things as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but an amazing artist. As he grew up, he realised that actually he had a much greater skill, and that skill is he can be placed in a helicopter and fly around, for example, London or central London, and then go back to a room and be presented with a, a sheet of white paper that's like six meters long. Yeah. And over the course of a week, can draw central London in incredible detail from memory. It's unbelievable. I mean, the, the things incredible. that he creates. You know, and he does this. He's done New York. He's done Singapore. He's done Tokyo. He's done... And if you look at... If you just Google him, Stephen Wilcher... Um, you know, artistic savant, you'll see online, you click on Google images and you'll see some of his drawings. And when you realize, when you look at them and realize he did this from memory, you know, neuroscientists, some of the world's brightest brain doctors have no idea how he can do that. Incredible. They have an, they have an inkling of yeah. how the brain works and what's going on in all the different regions of the brain, but actually they can't say for definite, this is what's going on. So, so we, you're absolutely right, Pete. We've only scratched the surface of what we can do and what we can achieve as humans. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and to, I think, anybody who stands up and professes, as I said at that conference, that we know people um, are, are full of themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So tell me about BIQ, man. What's the, with the goal? And obviously, you tell me what you want to tell me because, uh, you know, certain things are not launched yet. But yeah, tell me yeah. what your goal is and, and what you're working on, if as much as you're willing to. So, so BIQ is a behavioral insights company, and that's absolutely always been our mission, to deliver behavioral insight to people that allows them to make better and safer financial decisions. That was all, that's kind of like the, the, the strap line, mm-hmm. if you like, of what we're trying to do. But, but ultimately, the idea is what we want to do is we want to say to people two things. Number one, you are biased. Mm-hmm. Every human is biased. And that doesn't mean, mean that you're right or wrong. It just means that you're human. Mm-hmm. And understanding that you are biased means that every decision you make won't be a pure decision. Okay. It won't be a rational decision. It will be informed and influenced by certain degrees of irrationality. And these biases are the, the catalyst for that irrational thinking. So what we wanted to do was give people a practical tool, give, give them an app that says, you know what? We're not going to test you. You're not, you're not in a lab. You know, this is you in your real life. So I'll tell you what, let's play games. Yeah. And, and, and let's play a game of, um, we have a game that we've designed for confirmation bias, which is a card game. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, a, it's a game. People go, oh, I'll play this game. And, and they've got to do something. And, um, and at the end of it, it reveals the answer. And they go, wow, that was, that was interesting. But what we've discovered is to what degree confirmation bias features in that in, in that process mm-hmm. and that and that allows us then to deliver an insight to that person that says in a non-judgmental way look you know confirmation bias is is, is in every human being um, and these aren't the words by the way but but like um and you are more affected more so than other people that means that when you're making a decision you should pause and slow down and perhaps look for other evidence that may con- you know may, may contradict what you think and may not um but try and form a full a more rounded view of the world before you make a decision so it's it's that type of insight and mm. and um tips and tricks yeah, exactly. that we want that practical we want to give stuff. yeah practical stuff that people go oh i get it i can do that i understand what they're saying so that's what we want to do for consumers but what we also want to work with Um, closely with um, advisors and, and companies who offer services to customers mm. and say to them look if you had this insight as well, it allows you to create a structure whereby you know 
who you need to speak to and when. Mm. You don't need to, you know, when when the markets are falling three days in a row, you don't need to pick up the phone or email every single one of your clients. Mm. You do need to, however, email these 30 mm. who have high loss aversion, blah, 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 exactly. whatever, the, whatever the behaviors are. Uh, somebody said to me recently, and, and it was related to um, when the Brexit thing happened, and he said, oh, the day after the markets fell, and he said, oh, I emailed every one of my clients to say, don't worry, it, you know, this is happening. <laughs> uh, and I said to him, see, that for me is, is an error, because what you've done with a certain part of your client bank is you've kind of, you've woken a sleeping giant. <laughs> I wasn't worried, now I am. <laughs> Didn't need to tell them. <laughs> no, exactly. Didn't need to tell them. Because behaviorally, their behavioral profile is such that they were probably going, and yeah. this part of your client bank were terrified mm. and, and needed that gentle handhold to say, don't worry. And then they went, okay, fine. But right. to, to, to do a blanket email or communication to everybody um, isn't what the right approach, isn't the right approach. And actually the idea behind BIQ is to give customers, but actually to give people like yourself, the, the, the ammunition, the insight, the intelligence to be able to have those informed discussions with clients when you need to have them and with who you need to have them with, not just a kind of a based on a know your client profile, which I think gives you some of the picture, but not all of the picture. I I cannot wait for this to get <laughs> into the public's hands. And I, I know everybody listening to this will now be itching. The oh, come on. It's not out yet. Come on. So we'll definitely need to get you back. Not long. Not long. No, we need to get you back when it is. I think we'll make a big splash about it because I think this is really important uh, as you do to great. get this into people's hands and uh, and help them make more informed, intelligent, self-aware decisions around their, their money in Absolutely. order to secure their own financial future, which is the whole Absolutely. point. Mate, where so, can people uh, find out more? Um, so the website is biq.com. So B-E-I-Q.com. Mm -hmm. That's the website. Um, all of that will be updated in the coming months to reflect the fact that we're launching this new product. Mm -hmm. um, we already have products out there, but this is the, the will become the new flagship product. Um, and if they want to know more about this stuff anyway, they can follow either me on Twitter, and that's at Neil Beige, N-E-I-L-B-A-G-E, -E, um, or they can also follow the company, which is at Behavioral IQ. And for any listeners outside of the UK, that is spent, spelt in the UK way. With a U. <laughs> Not in the American way. Yeah, quite right too. Neil, it's been a delight, mate. Thank you so much for joining me. Wishing well, you, you all the success with BIQ and uh, we Thanks watch you. with great interest and excitement. Thanks for joining me, mate. Appreciate it. Welcome. Take care. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that, folks. Neil is a great guy with a real passion for helping as many people as possible understand this stuff and apply it and get to know themselves. So when the app that they're building launches, I'll be sure to make a big noise about it. So watch this space for that. Review this week from Grateful Sandra. Love that. And she headlines her, reviews very, her review very simply. Thank you. I'm very grateful to Pete and his show. I started listening in February 2017 when I had close to £40,000 worth of consumer debt. Pete's advice has motivated me to change my lifestyle radically. And close to two years later, not only have I paid off all my debt, I now have close to £20,000 worth of savings, and I'm loving my new simpler but happier lifestyle. I would highly recommend this show to anyone at any point of their financial journey. Thanks, Pete. I feel slightly choked by that, I have to say. Sandra, I'm grateful to you for leaving that review and grateful to you for crediting me with a little bit of the inspiration. But you have done incredible work a sixty thousand pound turnaround in less than two years paying off 40 grand worth of debt that was hanging over you building 20 grand worth of savings that's just outstanding please keep going please keep in touch i'd love to talk to you a little bit more about what you've achieved um and thank you you know that's uh, it's amazing to hear this stuff and it really encourages me to keep going um, I'm astounded. That's an incredible turnaround. So well done. Massive kudos to you. Um, and hopefully anybody else listening to this or watching it, that's encouraging for you too. Whew, amazing. Okay, a bit of a reminder. This is the last chance, really, the last chance reminder that I'll be doing a Q&A session to round off this season as usual. Get your questions in, in the next 24, 48 hours after this episode goes live, because I'll be writing it now, um, to season14 at meaningfulmoney.tv. Any questions about this new accumulator season, season 14 at MeaningfulMoney.tv, or you can leave them in the Facebook group. <laughs> Can't get my words out. Leave them in the Facebook group. MeaningfulMoney.tv slash community is the place to go to do that. 
So next time, uh, before the Q&A show, in a couple of weeks' time, next week we're going to be talking about the, the simple needs of new accumulators. We have a real tendency to overcomplicate things. So next week I want to remind us that particularly when we're starting out, our needs are very simple and should be easy to implement and maintain. Okay, so just some remind, reminders about that and some practical stuff, of course. Um, so check that out next week. That's it for this week. Let me cue up the music. But I uh, hope it was helpful. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Neil. What a legend. Any questions for him? Meaningfulmoney.tv slash N a eight for new accumulators episode eight also a full transcript and links and stuff there as well so hope you enjoyed it leave any questions for neil there i'll talk to you next week